The open world formula is perhaps the most overrepresented aspect of gaming in the last 10 years, and Zelda Breath of the Wild is the peak of that for many people. I understand why it's many people's favourite, but for me, there's a forgotten gem that not enough people talk about. For me, it's better than Breath of the Wild, it's the greatest open world game of all time, and that title is Gothic 2, with its expansion, Night of the Raven. Hi, Estelden here. Gothic 1 and 2 were released by Piranha Bytes back in the early 2000s, but I want to mention that I only actually played them for the first time five or six years ago. These aren't games I played as a kid and I've got like nostalgia goggles for them. I actually found them when looking for quality open world games because I'd gotten so bored and tired of titles like Assassin's Creed and Far Cry. I wanted something with some more depth. The premise of an open world game is fairly simple for most people. It's all about you as the player having a sense of freedom, being able to do what you want without the game designers pushing you quite obviously down a certain path. The open world removes that barrier by giving you all the freedom to explore how you like, or at least that's how it's meant to feel. My issue with the modern open world game, however, is I do feel that it's been taken a little bit too far. If we look at Breath of the Wild, or even the Elder Scrolls Oblivion, and yes I know the latter is not really recent, but it's where the rot kind of started. But you can genuinely go just about anywhere on the map in those games from the start. And that's considered their selling point. You can go anywhere, you can do anything, the world is at your feet. The problem that creates though is if a game is designed to let you go anywhere you want within reason, can it be challenging? Not really, because it means almost every enemy in every situation has to be around the same level of difficulty, or at least that's how most of these games seem to go. And that brings us to Gothic 2, because this is the open world game that completely solved that problem, and it was solved over 15 years ago. I can sum up why this game is amazing in one sentence. It's an open world game with direction. Most open world games don't really have any direction, I believe it's why a lot of people have been getting pretty sick of the modern ones. It's fairly common that I'll go online and I'll see all the Ubisoft open world games getting mocked for pretty much all being the same. We've got Watch Dogs Legion coming out at the end of the month, and I can pretty much guarantee it's going to have another open world that feels identical in design to the rest of their titles. You'll be able to go anywhere you want from the start without much challenge at all. All the activities, they're pretty much going to feel copy and pasted, and it's not going to feel interesting. I'm happy to make that prediction. The way Gothic 2 is designed, though, is to give you the feeling of freedom while still guiding you down the most efficient path, but it does so subtly. There is a lot you can do quite early on in the game. There's a large world to explore. There's caves, there's hills, there's a huge town. It's got all the things that make Breath of the Wild and similar games feel great and why they're popular, but it applies all of these elements quite a bit differently. Starting out, very early on you actually encounter the biggest town in the game, and that's Corinus. It's one of the greatest cities in gaming. The reason this city is fantastic is not only is it large, but basically every NPC is interesting. Almost all of them are going to have unique dialogue, and it's not fluff. Just about all of them will be associated with a quest, or have a purpose for being there. They aren't NPCs that just exist to give the town the feeling of being alive. Because it is alive, practically, not just visually, because there's the potential to do something with almost everyone in the city. Breath of the Wild, on the other hand, and I don't single this game out because I think it's the worst. A lot of modern open world games do this as well, but I feel it's the best example because people are constantly saying it's the gold standard. So that's why I'm comparing Gothic 2 with it. So in this Zelda game, a lot of the towns do the old MMO exclamation mark that was popularized by World of Warcraft, I believe. What that means is the only people of interest have some sort of icon telling you that they've got a quest. What that does is renders the town into pretty much just being eye candy, with the only actual content being brought to you on a platter the second you arrive. You can see everything, you just look for the exclamation mark, you don't need to talk to anyone else. What is the point, practically, of doing any actual exploring when I know who is worth speaking to the second I arrive? It sucks. And games are designed around this now so that little Timmy doesn't arrive in a big town and go, oh no, I don't know where to go, I don't know who to speak to, this is too overwhelming, I'm going to turn the game off. Which is sad because exploring used to be efficient, but now it seems to be an activity that's only for people who want to make their own fun, because that's honestly the only reason to explore most of the towns in Breath of the Wild, for the most part. I mean, there's a few cool quests and things to find that you might discover on your own, but I just found getting to them, I'd see a bunch of the MMO quest markers, I'd even accept a quest, and most of the rewards were just like junk. But obviously towns are a small part of an open world game, and that applies to both Gothic 2 and Breath of the Wild. In both of these games, the wide open world is the selling point, although they both go about this very differently, particularly in how they handle enemies and the world design. 
You see, in Gothic 2, there's almost tiers of enemies, and I think that is the best way to break it down. Basically what that means is the tier 1 enemies, which in this case are the weakest enemies, they're like the blood flies and the mole rats. They're quite similar in strength, and they'll die about as quickly as each other, and they've been hand placed around the world in a very careful and purposeful fashion. Now these enemies are easy to kill for even a beginner, and you can pretty much just mash your attack button and you're going to be fine. However, you're also going to encounter tougher enemies, and these might be tier 2 enemies, such as the black wolves and the boars. These are once again equal in strength, but they're tougher than the tier 1 enemies I mentioned before. Keeping in mind that these enemies aren't labelled as tier this, tier that, I've just come up with that to make it easier to explain, but as you play, you'll naturally figure out that some enemies are stronger than others. Because these enemies are so different in strength, it means you're going to want to explore the areas with the easy tier 1 enemies first. And because this is an RPG, as you kill the enemies, you're going to gain XP, you're going to get stronger. The great part is, those enemies don't respawn, so it's kind of like Divinity Original Sin if you played that one. Once you kill some enemies, they're gone. They aren't going to just bother you again, you can't just go grinding them, they're absolutely gone, meaning your power gains in the game are not infinite, it is very controlled. I want to put a caveat on that though, because in later chapters they do add enemies to the map again, so it's not like it's empty for the whole game because you killed them, but it does mean you can't go grinding enemies forever. There's a very select amount. So at the beginning of the game, when you're quite weak, you're also going to have a very hard time killing the tier 2 or above enemies that I mentioned. And that is where the direction in this game comes in. I can technically explore all of the map in any order that I want, just like in Breath of the Wild. I can go east, I can go west, I can go anywhere. But unless I'm quite an experienced player, I'm going to struggle. So I'm best off starting with the areas that have the weaker enemies first. Now, if you haven't played this game before, I need to make something really clear. The areas I'm talking about, they're not spread off from each other. So it's not like, oh, if I go to this particular area, it's all going to be the tier one easy enemies. And then if I go over here, it's going to be the hard ones. It's not like that because heaps of games do that. What this particular title does is in each of the areas, the difficulty of the enemies is completely spread out. So you're going to get some really tough enemies. You're also going to get some easy ones. And that means when you return to an area, maybe 30, 40 hours of playtime later, there's going to be enemies there that you couldn't kill earlier on. And that keeps the game dangerous. It keeps it feeling exciting all of the time. Because you've always got to have your wits about you. There could be like a black troll around the corner. There could be something tough. So for example, to my left, I might see a cave with a couple of weak mole rats. To my right is a couple of really savage looking black wolves. Now the black wolves, they're not an artificial barrier. They aren't like in Assassin's Creed, where they used to actually physically put a big barrier to stop you from exploring. You had to come back later. This time, the developers are saying, look, you can take on the black wolves if you want. You can kill them and you'll probably get some awesome loot in that cave behind them. But you're probably best going down the easy path first and coming back when you're a bit stronger. This is giving me the choice, but also giving me direction. It means the game is level designed. It's not just a free-for-all field with no real aim. Exploring the world is almost like a jigsaw puzzle because the most efficient way is to slowly clear and explore the areas with the tier 1 or weakest enemies first. And you slowly work your way up those tiers of enemies as you get stronger. It's immensely satisfying because those black wolves who you really struggle with early on, as you level up, you're going to come back, you're going to one-shot them, you'll get revenge for when they fucked you up early on, and that gives you a real sense of fulfillment. For me, this is something Breath of the Wild just really lacked. It had no sense of progression in the open world. I mean, sure, you could go and find a Korix seed, but who gives a shit? They stop being interesting or really helping you after the first couple of dozen, let's be honest. In Gothic 2, you're getting stronger with every kill. And because there's no level scaling, it's not meaningless XP like it was in Elder Scrolls Oblivion. Since eventually you'll get to the point at the end of the game when you're no longer a weakling and you can kill everything on the map with pretty much ease. But it takes a long time to get there and it's going to be a testing time. It's going to be a great challenge for you to reach that point. The other problem in Breath of the Wild is most of the interesting content is instanced. And what I mean by that is you've got to go through like a loading screen to get to a shrine. It takes you out of the open world. I just find it a little bit odd, but I'm constantly told that the open world in Breath of the Wild is the selling point, but 90% of the handmade content is in the dungeons and the shrines. That to me is just a poor balance given how much time is spent in the open world. I know there are some puzzles around the place, but there's far more aimless wandering around the map with the sole purpose being of trying to find the damn shrines. 
The gameplay loop for me in Breath of the Wild was killing repetitive enemies, all of relatively the same difficulty level, watching my weapon break, picking up another, looking around for a shrine, maybe try and explore even though I knew 99% of the time I'm just going to find another fucking Korok seed and that was about it. In Gothic 2, my gameplay loop is not at all linear and simple, I'm constantly thinking about what I'm doing. Hmm, I've gained a couple of levels, perhaps I'll go back to that cave from earlier in the game that was guarded by those field raiders. I was too weak to kill them, I know I'm going to gain XP if I go back and that'll see my character get stronger once again. I may even find some of the hand placed stat upgrades, in this case they're actually herbs you can pick up the ground, they're fantastic. You find them scattered around the world in difficult to find locations and they'll actually increase your power when you pick it up, there is nothing better to find, it's really awesome, way better than Korok Seeds. I may even find a unique powerful weapon that feels appropriate given I've overcome a challenge, I've killed a whole bunch of tough enemies. There is so much to conquer and discover and the best thing is it's all in the open world. It's not hidden in shrines or dungeons because this is an open world game. It's about the world. It's not a hub that exists as busy work for you to find the real content. And again, I don't mean to pick on Breath of the Wild specifically. You can apply this to like 99% of modern open world games. Backing that up, the gameplay options are vast in Gothic 2 and the combat has strategy. It's not just about melee or bows, there's a magic system. And it means if you focus on being a mage, exploring the world's actually going to be quite a bit different for you. And not just due to combat differences, but also because you'll be looking for different upgrades for your character, meaning if if you replay the game, you're going to get a much different experience rather than pretty much the same one that you're going to get in most open world games if you replay them these days. That even applies to Skyrim, which actually does have some of Gothic's RPG characteristics because in that game you can join any faction you want essentially, regardless of the class or the skills you focus on. And that means that while you might get a different combat experience on the replay, the content experience is pretty much going to be the same. It's not the case in Gothic 2 because your class actually opens up unique areas to explore. For me, it's this unique direction that separates both Gothic 2 and also the first game in the series Gothic 1 from almost all open world games out there. The Elder Scrolls Morrowind has a lot of similar elements and I really enjoy it, it is much better than its sequels. But I will say that it still doesn't quite compare to the open world design of the Gothic titles. The reason I think the modern open world trend honestly started is developers like Ubisoft quickly realised that they didn't really have to do any level design anymore. When you're designing areas around players progressing in a certain way, there's likely a lot more work required than just throwing you in a pointless sandbox and away you go. I've noticed this with a lot of Ubisoft titles and if I go online I see a lot of like articles and videos telling me about how detailed Ubisoft's worlds are, but it's purely on the visual side. They'll talk about like, oh an NPC he walks over here, he does his job over here, but it has absolutely no consequence on the gameplay or what I'm actually doing as the character. The world itself, extremely simple from a gameplay perspective, it's only complex on the visual side. And I'm going to be honest, like graphics, great graphics, they look good, the people doing all that are really talented, but I really care about the gameplay first and my own personal experience in the game. And that isn't the most immersive part to me, how everything looks, how big the city is technically. For me, it's about how I interact with the game world, the interesting content, and Ubisoft games have just been fucking lacking it for years. So on top of all that, it just means games can be designed in such a way that more casual players are never going to encounter a challenge they can't overcome and therefore they're always going to feel like a winner. But I'll tell you what, it gets old. That player might feel like a winner temporarily, but as time goes on, he's going to realise that most of the copy and pasted content we see in so many open world games, it just feels pointless. It offers no progression, and therefore it starts to become less and less fun. Gothic 2 remains fun, and picking it up again recently, it was an absolute blast as always. I really hope that in time, people start to see the flaws in these modern titles, and they have a drop in sales. And that forces them to look towards quality instead of streamlining everything, and they take a gander in that case, and look at games like Gothic 2 and they realise what has been missing. So my stance, it very much is that Gothic 2 is the king of open world games and it is much better than Breath of the Wild. I do want to clarify as well that I'm very much talking about the open world aspects of both games. So obviously Breath of the Wild, it's got other elements to it aside from the open world. You've got the puzzles in all the shrines, you've got the dungeons, there's some cool boss battles in there as well. That stuff's all great, I didn't mind those parts of the games. But I'm talking about the open world side, and so many people tell me Breath of the Wild it is peak open world. 
I just don't think so. I think Gothic 1 is better with the open world. Gothic 2, even better than that. That's like the king of all those games. So I think it deserves a bit more representation. Now, I understand that a lot of people are going to disagree with me, particularly on me being critical of Breath of the Wild. I know it's a bit of a critical darling. A lot of people enjoy it. And I understand that. I, I do get it. It's just for me, when I play games, the efficiency of playing and enjoying the content and really diving in that way, that is the draw. And I think that Breath of the Wild's just very different. All I really hope, because I don't want to take that experience away from other people. I know a lot of people do like it. And look, for what it is, it's a well-crafted game. I'm never going to deny that. I just hope that we get both styles of open worlds in the future. So we get the Gothic 2 style as well as the Breath of the Wild style, that's fine. But I just don't want to see every game go down the Breath of the Wild track where there's a lot of make your own fun stuff in there. I think they got very popular with Skyrim. I think it's actually one of the reasons Nintendo wanted to emulate that game. There was a lot of talk years ago, a lot of rumors went around that Nintendo were trying to basically emulate the success that Skyrim had because they released Skyward Sword back in 2011, I think it was, and it didn't have the same success as Skyrim, which came out in the same year. So Nintendo went down that road. Obviously, it was very popular. I think Zelda's going to go and continue down that track. It's working for them. I just hope we get the gothic style and I want to hear your opinions as well tell me why I'm wrong about Breath of the Wild tell me why you love gothic if you have played it and I will say if you haven't played it please give it a chance because if you enjoy open world games really like it's it's the pinnacle at least for me and I, I really enjoyed making this video as well. It's a little bit different than some of my more recent ones that have been a bit more news-based. Something's happened. I've tried to kind of talk about it. But I honestly felt more passionate about making this one. I think this one and the Immersive Sim video, Immersive Sims are Dead, that I put out a few days ago, I think they were a couple of ones I really enjoyed making. And I think more people tended to like them. So let me know what you think. If you did enjoy the video, please comment, like, and subscribe. I'll see you on the next one. Thanks very much and bye-bye.